Welcome to the OncLive Peer Exchange Editorial Video Series, Advances and Issues in the Management of Hodgkin Lymphoma. My name is Dr. Peter Salgo. I'm a professor of medicine and anesthesiology at Columbia University and an associate director of surgical intensive care at New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. Today's panel discussion is going to focus on the treatment of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. All of these videos, by the way, can be found on the Peer Exchange channel on OncLive.com. I have a real privilege today. I'm moderating a panel of leading experts and frontline practitioners. Our discussion is going to focus on a range of relevant issues and challenges, including best practices for first-line treatment and monitoring of Hodgkin lymphoma, the latest evidence for treating relapsing or refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, and the future of Hodgkin lymphoma treatment, novel therapies, and ongoing research. And I'm joined today by Dr. Jonathan W. Friedberg, MD, Professor of Medicine and Oncology, Chief Hematology Oncology Division, Acting Director, Wilmot Cancer Center, James P. Wilmot Cancer Center of the University of Rochester. Paul A. Hamlin, MD, Director, Lymphoma Outpatient Activities, Division of Hematologic Oncology, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, New York, New York. Craig Moskowitz, MD, Clinical Director, Division of Hematologic Oncology, Attending Physician, Lymphoma and Adult BMT Services, Member, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Professor of Medicine at Weill Medical College of Cornell University. And Lauren C. Pinter Brown, MD, FACP, Clinical Professor of Medicine at the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Let's put all this in perspective. About 9,000 new cases of Hodgkin lymphoma are going to be diagnosed in 2013. Almost 1,200 people will die of the disease in the United States. Despite high cure rates with a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, approximately 10% of patients fail to respond to treatment, and about 20 to 30% who initially respond have a subsequent relapse, which greatly increases mortality. Among patients who relapse following autologous stem cell transplantation, 45% will die within two years, and 68% will die within five years. Those numbers are big. Their median survival is less than three years. Patients who fail to respond to induction chemotherapy, about 10 to 20% of all presenting patients, have an eight-year survival rate of less than 10%. Patients who relapse after autologous stem cell transplantation, elderly patients, patients who may not be able to tolerate intensive therapy, patients whose chemosensitivity is inadequate to proceed to transplantation, all not likely to be cured by standard Hodgkin lymphoma treatment modalities. These patients may benefit from novel agents that exploit alternative mechanisms of action. One of the most important areas of research today in the field of Hodgkin lymphoma involves the study of novel treatments that could potentially improve the lives of patients not cured by standard therapy. So, we're going to take a look at single modality versus combined modality treatment. And our first question is for you, Dr. Moskowitz. Why don't you lead off our discussion of the appropriate candidates for each kind of approach and their patient characteristics. So why don't we start with this. When is it appropriate to use a risk-adapted approach? So I think we're going to talk about early-stage Hodgkin lymphoma to begin with. And uh, I think it's reasonable to divide early-stage Hodgkin lymphoma into three broad categories. It's this favorable early-stage Hodgkin lymphoma, unfavorable early-stage Hodgkin lymphoma, and bulky stage 2 Hodgkin lymphoma. Standard treatment for these patients, depending on which side of the pond you live on, mm -hmm. is either combined modality therapy, which includes chemotherapy followed by radiation, or chemotherapy alone, especially in patients who do not have bulky disease presentation. The question is, can we either eliminate radiation therapy as part of primary management, or can we reduce the number of cycles of chemotherapy we give for patients with early stage disease, hence the concept risk-adapted therapy, which from my point of view is a clinical trials question. Risk-adapted therapy has not made it to the prime time yet uh, for primary practitioners to use for their management of Hodgkin lymphoma. If you go back to the early 60s and 70s where we gave extensive radiation therapy treatments, now 30, 40, 50 years later we've seen the consequences of the long-term side effects of radiation. That may not be the case with more modern radiation therapy techniques, but at, at the end of the day, um, is it important to give radiation therapy and chemotherapy to all patients with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma? And I would argue it's not. We just have to figure out which patients will not benefit from the addition of radiation therapy. So if risk-adapted approach is still not ready for prime time, why isn't it? Anybody want to jump in on this? I think the first point I'd make is just to reinforce what Craig said, that 
Uh, the median age of patients who present with Hodgkin lymphoma is 29. So paying attention to a lifelong risk of toxicities is incredibly important. And at some level, we all do risk-adapted approaches in that the three broad categories that Craig portrayed, bulky stage two Hodgkin lymphoma, for years has been approached very differently from more early stage disease. But I think the issue is some of our tools that we're proposing to use in the future for risk-adapted approaches are not quite ready for prime time. All right, but I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, th I think just to follow on that, when we think about early stage disease, we're, we're really thinking about a disease where we have a lot of success. And so the bar here is pretty high. And for us, the goal is to maintain high curability and diminish long-term toxicity. And, and that's a different paradigm. If you were to tell somebody 30 years ago, let's say 25 years old, that we're going to use radiation therapy, we're going to give you 30, 35 years of life, after which you might have some issues, that person would probably say, I'll take that deal, right? So what's wrong with radiation therapy? Well, I think that, that we're now seeing the fruition of the, those discussions. Time to pay these, up, huh? Right. These, these people are now 50 years old, 60 years old, and they have a lot of health issues. And none of us are happy about having to watch them go through these additional health issues for therapy that we thought was very reasonable 30 years ago. So you, you, you actually could take this into uh, of the broad context of the management of these patients with early stage disease. So I like to use a hypothetical 100 patients. Um, in the patient population that we're talking about right now, let's say that we cure somewhere between 90 and 95 of the 100 patients. But the key thing is curing the patients with the least amount of treatment. Okay. So if that's the case, then um, when designing clinical research studies, most folks are doing the risk-adapted approach, which, you, which was a question you raised in the beginning. Right. And there was a study that was presented at uh, the American Society of Hematology meetings in uh, December, just a few months ago, which I think is uh, all of us uh, can speak on for an extended period of time. It's called the RAPID study. Um, and the RAPID study uh, was led by the British National Lymphoma Study Group where they took a patient population of early stage Hodgkin lymphoma, not the best and not the worst, somewhere in the middle. And what they said was, can we reduce radiation therapy to the majority of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma by using a PET scan to help guide our treatment? And this is a 600 patient study. And at the end of the day, and I'll certainly let my colleagues uh, have their viewpoint, 91% um, of the patients who received chemotherapy alone are free from disease at four years, and 97% of the patients who received chemotherapy and radiation are without disease at four years. So the, so the big question is, should we radiate all 100 patients to help six?